Roger Williams University is hosting a crisis management seminar on May 3rd at their Providence campus. Crises, whether a natural disaster, cyber attack, or financial instability, can have severe repercussions if not handled properly. This is where crisis management plays a pivotal role. Join Roger Williams' MBA students and expert speakers to learn how to prepare for the unexpected. The program is totally free and open to the public. You can register online at rwu.edu slash events slash crisis dash management dash symposium. This is the Bartholomew Town Podcast. The warm weather's here. And by the way, that doesn't stop a lot of people from using their bicycle throughout the year here in Rhode Island. But certainly as we get into the warm season, it starts to become more of an activity. It starts to become more of, in some cases, even a primary mode of transportation. And joining us to talk about some initiatives that are both ongoing and upcoming is the executive director of Bike Newport, the one, the only Barry Freeman. Thanks so much for making the time. Thanks for being here. I mean, thanks for having us, Bill. And, um, and yeah, that was a great point that you made. People talk about biking as a you know a four month activity, and it's not. It's year round. We have to think about all of the people who are doing it uh, for fun and for transportation year round, and uh, that's a big reason why we're here. Well, it's a major aspect of sort of reimagining urban planning. There's this concept of fifteen minute cities, which is pretty pragmatic, where just about everything you need is within a 15 minute walk. If you add a a bike into that conversation, it takes it even further. We've seen it here in Providence where there's been community pushback on some of the bike lanes that have been created down in Newport. It's been, it seems anyway, it's been a little bit more harmonious in terms of developing bike lanes, particularly on Broadway where yes, it's not a dedicated lane, but it's marked pretty well. So It just seems to be functioning. That's my perspective. I guess from yours, talk about just right out of the gate, laying out a bike culture in Newport. Um, yeah, it is very much about uh, about a bike culture. In fact, you know, we're continuing to hold steadfast and pick up on the momentum from people and policies and funding that are all happening at the same time that are helping to build that bike culture. It's interesting your comparison between Providence and Newport. Uh, from my perspective, I would have flipped it and said, you know, we're so you know amazed at what's taking place in Providence because the effort is being made to separate bikes and cars, which is the big differentiator when it comes to getting more people biking. You know, the 60% of the population that really would like to bike um, they're interested but concerned or not getting on the road with cars. So the paint is there. It helps to raise awareness. It helps people who are already feeling confident uh, to be on the road. Uh, but we're going to make the big change in culture, change the distribution of the mode share when bikes are separated from cars. And the problem is that that happens in in bites and, and in disconnected bites. So when we do get separation, There's no way to get to it and no way to get from it. So it's basically the same people who are already on the road are now are now moved out of harm's way. uh, But we're not getting new people on and people look at that infrastructure and say, hey, it's in the middle of nowhere. and Nobody's using it. Why is nobody using that new um, separated bike path? Because there's no way to get to it, no way to get from it. And we need like a really consistent connection from start to finish for people who are less confident or uh, or kids or you know, folks who really do want to do that half mile or one mile trip without having to get in a car, um, we're only going to make that kind of progress uh, when we're connected, um, you know, citywide. So I see Providence making those steps um, in pieces, but, you know, we can see what needs to be connected. Uh, In Newport, we're getting really good with paint, uh, which raises awareness and helps people know where to be. Um, But uh, thanks to, you know, the surges in government interest and funding that's coming through the combination of Infrastructure and Climate Act, um, you know, we're seeing funding to reduce carbon carbon output in small areas. And that, you know, really defines Newport, you know, incredibly congested traffic that could uh, very easily with intention, you know, be switched to biking and walking which is a far more pleasant experience anyway. One one example of where this is sort of, I don't know if you would say beta tested, but it, it certainly shows the the 
potential alleviation of congestion is events at Fort Adams. I think of the folk and jazz festivals where there's a huge bike presence. A lot of people smartly will ride a bike into the fort from downtown or wherever to avoid that sometimes hours wait to get out of the festival in particular. And even now at the ocean race the that's happening down at Fort Adams, do those events sort of serve as maybe a glimpse into what's possible for you in terms of bike parking, in terms of the amount of people who are on bikes getting, using it as a mode of transportation, not, not as a mode of exercise? Yeah, really well said. <laughs> Great point. At the, the Folk Festival, we have gotten up to 1,800 bikes a day, which is fully 18% of the people who are attending the festival. And, you know, those folks sail in and out past the cars. Over the years, we went from about 200, you know, in the beginning up to the 1,800 per day because people see it and they say, wow, I don't have to be in my car um, you know, I can get in and out easily. We work really, really closely uh, with the police department constantly each year changing how we do it um, in great communication so that we can move these seas of cyclists. So the festivals is the trickle in all day long, a steady flow. Um, and then at the end of the day, at the end of the concert, it's this massive departure of, you know, 1800 bikes at once. So there's a lot of thinking that goes into how to manage that, how to manage folks in the city, how to sign it, how to communicate. You know, it's the first thing you see when you go to the folk festival site about how to get there is ride a bike and here's how, uh, and we set up park and bikes. It's just a lot of planning that goes into it and management. It really shows what's possible. In general, there's a lot of naysayers that point out, look, Rhode Island's cold, Really, unfortunately, a lot of the year, so maybe even much of the year, there's sometimes snow, although we had less snow this year, that were so spread out that the idea of undoing car culture is impractical. In fact, even as a bike and walking advocate myself, I've you know I go back and forth between Providence and Newport multiple, multiple times per week, sometimes per day, South County. I go to East Providence, the East East Bay every day to do a radio show. There's zero chance I could ride my bike as a primary mode of transportation, and I don't feel bad about driving my car. At the same time, I advocate for an expansion of bike lanes. What's your message to people out there, though, that say, no, we're a car state, and we shouldn't be putting any effort, any dollars into not only advocating for for an advancement in bike culture but also for take as it's framed anyway i think of the south water street bike lane in providence taking away space for vehicles what's your message to those folks about the practicality of bikes in rhode island yeah as you can imagine it's a very um complex uh question that you just asked and the complexity is really the answer it's not you know bikes or cars it's not, you know, give up your car, you know, that's so we so we can do this. It's multimodal. You know, we've got ferries, we've got transit that needs attention, we have bike lanes that need attention. What we want to do is get away from, you know, just the default of everybody getting in a car. And this is what we see in cities that, you know, really accomplish multimodal. The economic benefits of getting people out of the cars is enormous. You take a city like Newport where people are, you know, in their car, stressed out, looking for parking, you know, not able to stop, trying to figure it out before they get there. You leave your car out of town and you have shuttles and transit and bikes. You're doing all that driving. You have your bike in the back of your car. You park someplace easy, pop on your bike and off you go. You know, I went into Philadelphia um, just this weekend. And the last couple of times I went, I brought my bike on Amtrak, you know, a little folding bike. I get out in 30th Street Station and I'm off to my kid's house. I didn't have it with me this time. It was more complicated. You know, it was and I was seeing the people outside riding and thinking, dang, I wish I brought my bike. Um, and the same thing happens when any of us have to get somewhere quickly in Newport you know, your brain goes to, I got to get there fast. I got to get my car. Forget it. It takes you three times as long to get there with a the car as it would if you popped on your bike and went there. But we need to have the infrastructure to do that. We need to respond to people who want to do this. And there's this really interesting project going on called Ride Island. Uh, it was funded by Van Buren and Van Buren Charitable Foundation and brought together Grow Smart Rhode Island and Bike Newport to sort of spearhead it. And it's taking a look at every plan, every comment that's ever been made about biking and walking on Aquidneck Island over the last couple of decades. 
and pulled all that information together and mapped it all out to see, you know, kind of where the hotspots are for discussion and such, um, so that we're looking at existing information. But it also did something else. It found three things that were missing. So it didn't go back and talk to the same people again, but it went to three groups that had not been spoken with. One is the Spanish dominant bicycle commuter who's out there all the time and makes up the majority of the commuter bicyclists on the island. And they've never been engaged in Spanish, you know, in their community about what's good, what's bad, what's ugly, what they need, what they're happy with, what they're afraid of. The second is kids. We're always yelling at them. You can't do that. But <laughs> like we need to talk to them about where they want to go, how they want to get there, you know, and, and get their perspective. And the third is this group of people who uh, either don't have cars or don't have like constant access to cars. Transit is not delivering. Um, and, you know, and they and they really would like to ride a bicycle. They don't have one. They don't have the education to go with it. They don't have the confidence for it. So that non-car owning, I would be interested in biking. The, the Spanish dominant commuter and kids are the three groups that had never been spoken with that now we've had meetings with and have added that perspective. So it's very much about our planning being well-informed by the people who are using it, who need it, who would like to. Um, and framing uh, this connected network that we were talking about, connectivity being so key um, around all of that information that we've been collecting for so long. Mm. Yeah, you just, I, I love the way you frame that. And that's like the buzzword that I'm going to have to deploy every time I get into these, in, these conversations, which is multimodal. It's not apples and oranges. You know, you, you can only have one, you can only get one fruit and check out. It's like, that that concept is so strong, and you're right. Transit is weak in Rhode Island. Let's be honest about it. You know, as somebody who lived in New York for ten years and still is there many many weekends, you know, if you compare that to riding Ripta, and that's kind of why I said earlier in the interview, yeah, I don't really feel bad about driving to Newport or driving back to Providence because what am I going to do? The transit is very impractical if you're in a in a professional or, or any type of environment where you're on a clock, um, but that multimodal concept of park somewhere outside of, for lack of a better term, the city limits in Newport and ride your bike, that's very practical. That's something that a lot of people like to do. I wonder sometimes about bike storage. I'm fortunate that I have enough friends in town where I can actually leave a bike at, at a couple of different friends' house throughout the course of the warm season so that I can do just what you said there, park on the outskirts and then bike throughout the city. I've always wondered about that. Is there, you know, we see it at golf courses where people store their clubs or whatever it is. Now there's some conversation around this, even with guns, like leave it at the range. Maybe that's a compromise of some sort on some of these, these, these gun questions. What about that? Is that something that ever comes up? The idea of like, a, I don't know how you do it other than having a pile of bikes on Broadway, but would anybody ever buy a, um, you know, a, a, a garage type facility for people to store their bikes in the heart of a city. Is that an idea? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling between just going quickly back to transit for one second. Yeah, and then please. No, no, no. There the are no rules around, <laughs> around bike parking because bike parking is a really interesting and very important conversation. Uh, but just going back to the transit thing for a minute, I sit on the transportation advisory committee for the state. So I'm really, you know, in on the studies and the reports coming in from all of the different uh, departments of the state uh, for consideration for transportation. And, you know, we talk about bikes and we talk about transit. Um, the the sort of um, umbrella around transit or the, the wrapping around transit in Rhode Island is that it's supposed to pay for itself, you know, and that's just not what transit does. And we just keep not putting enough money into it to have more stops, to have more routes, to have uh, more availability, to have a better schedule um, that gets more people using it. And, you know, we blame transit, you know, in all kinds of crazy ways when we're not investing in it. The same thing is with bike and ped. There's like a checking it off. Yes, we're going to do bike ped. Check, check, check. It's even at the top of the of the list or the top of the narrative very often. But how we're addressing it is not with the commitment to it working, to the commitment to getting more people to use these modes, we have to talk to people and find out what's keeping them from doing that, you know, which is some of the things that we were talking about. So the car centricity in Rhode Island is very budget-based. We talk a lot about these things, but the budget is really focused on, on, on car accommodation, especially on convenience. 
So we talk about a lot of money being invested to shorten a commute by 10 minutes. That's really important to workers, right? We don't talk about shortening the two hour bus route. The bus experience to do that same commute can be two hours. We don't talk about reducing that. We talk about 10 minutes in cars, but not you know, really hours in a bus that would make it possible for more people to choose to use the bus. So we have to shift the conversations to understand what convenience means, you know, what a dollar here versus a dollar there is, because it can be up to 10 to one, you know, for what it costs for mileage of highway uh, improvements compared to mileage of, of bike or transit improvements. And we have to have those conversations. You know, we can't just check the boxes every time that we say bike pad and it's, and it's a painted line. So, you know, that's one. The car centricity is mostly in budget and culture follows that. Mm. Um, is that Okay. Oh, that was. I think that's that's spectacular. There's no rules of uh, of engagement here. We can go anywhere we want. Okay, great. So, parking, bike parking, bike storage. We have a lot of people with bikes. Um, you know, our North End community. We talk about a lot. Um, we've distributed, you know, more than 800 bicycles during COVID that we restored and distributed in the community, getting more people to have bicycles. And we talk about the densely populated part of Newport, north of Admiral Kalbfuss, um, all of our neighborhoods of Newport Heights and Park Home and and uh, Festival Fields and, and Rolling Green. You know, they're all in a concentrated area, densely populated. Bikes are a great way to manage that, you know, the the not not great transit um, and the low car ownership double the rest of the city or the state but the houses themselves don't have a way to get a bike inside so you know we're trying to figure out how to help people manage their bikes maintain them store them and one of the things that we're talking about there is community uh shared garages shared shared culture is great we know it with cars we know it with bike share we know it with you know, telephones, you know, with everything, shared culture is great, you know, share your lawnmower, not everybody has to own one. So we're trying to think about how to have shared storage for bikes. But the other part is the bike parking. We're like bringing people in, but we're not greeting them when they get where they're going. So, you know, we can talk about zoning instead of having a certain number of car spaces, you know, for a business, one car space is 14 bikes. You know, so we need to work bike parking into the zoning regulations. We need to have more bike parking available. We need to, you know, incentivize businesses to have bike parking so that there's a place to put it other than, you know, lampposts, parking things and trees, you know, which is really what bike parking is for the most part in Newport. All, all extremely well said and, way, and well laid out. There's also another aspect to this, which is pretty critical, um, the whole physical fitness side of things. And look, not everyone's differently abled. Some folks cannot certainly ride a traditional bike uh, for, for any number of reasons, but those that do will reap the reward of enhanced physical fitness. I think of my dad, who is now 82 years old and still, he moved to Florida basically to do this, you know. No offense to Florida. Actually, yeah, offense to Florida. It's probably the best thing he's got down there. But it, he rides 15, 20, 25, 30, 40, 50 miles a day at 85. He's in supremely good health and has done so for my entire life. And I've grown up around bike culture as partially a mode of transit, but more than anything, just a key way to stay healthy. And that bit of advocacy, especially after going through COVID, I feel like we should be doing everything we can to merge health well-being on a mental health side, on a physical health side, on an emotional health side, all things that you can gain from being on a bike into our daily lives and make it less of like, all right, make sure you take your 30 minutes a day to go you know, do jumping jacks, but instead let's merge as much as we can. Talk about that. The the unintended, but well, I guess not unintended, but the the extremely uh, helpful and healthy benefits of that, that go along with everything else that we've just discussed. Yeah, absolutely. By the way, I'm just back a couple of weeks ago from Broward County in Florida, and I, you yeah. know, I have my issues with Florida, but biking <laughs> is not one of them. Every road I went on, there was a bike path. It's separated, incredible. like yeah. everywhere, every single road. Um, 
Yeah. So there's physical health and there's mental health. I mean, your dad is probably a pretty happy dude. You get off of your bike and you're smiling and people say, why are you smiling? And you say, because I just got off my bike. And there's a really amazing connection between mental health and physical activity, you know, as well as the physical health. I've had the privilege to bike in a lot of places, a lot of countries. When I hit those cities that have a lot of people biking, you don't see obesity. Like you really got to look for it. Um, and so we have physical health and mental health. There are lots of adaptive bikes now. We partner with this company in, in Warwick called Bike On, which coincidentally is the adaptive bike um, company for the whole country, uh, building bikes that are, you know, standard designs as well as, um, as well as unique designs for people with uh, either mobility or cognitive challenges to keep them on bikes. Uh, we're seeing a lot of good happening with e-bikes that keep people on bikes, the pedal assist keep people pedaling. It doesn't let a hill get in the way. And we're seeing a lot of people over a certain age staying on bikes by having uh, by having pedal assist. Um, there's no question about the physical and mental health benefits of biking. Um, it, it it just can't be it can't be overstated. And you know, to be able to pop on a bike uh, to get where you're going, or to have a mind clearing you know, endorphin fed um, experience, you know, uh, to, to clear your head, you know, in the middle of the day or, you know, on the weekend recreationally, just get, get where you're going on a bike. It's just a, a more pleasant and healthier experience. There's just no question about it. All right. Um, last thing here, I see Friday, May 19th is bike to work day. The logo has a seagull wearing a bike helmet. Can't go wrong with that. Uh, talk about that initiative. Um, yeah, we love that seagull. He's been around. Uh, he's been around for a while. Um, so yeah, we love people to to ditch the car for a day and give it a try. Uh, we'll welcome anyone uh, who's riding their bike to a breakfast outside of City Hall in the morning, uh, and coming back in the afternoon to make some uh, bike friendly announcements and to award the bike friendly business of the year uh, to a to a local business and take a little ride around town. Um, it's also uh, the last Friday of the ocean race. Um, so we'll probably uh, bring the group down there as well uh, at the end, a little group down, group ride down that way. Um, so yeah, ditch your bike, give it a try, gather your friends from work, do that thing we were talking about. If you're over a bridge or too far away, you know, get a little closer, park your car and pop on your bike for the last part of it. You know, you don't have to bike the whole way if you live too far or there's a bridge in your way. Um so uh, yeah, and we'll be outside of, of City Hall greeting folks. Um, so we do have, we have Bike to Work Day this Friday. We have two other really big events coming up. Uh, one is this celebration of the Big Blue Bike Barn, which I encourage everybody to find out about. It's this incredible precedent setting transformation of a vacant lot into one of the most vibrant, lush public spaces in Newport. There's a canopy designed by Roger Williams University student architects and a pump track uh, that's built by you know, pump track enthusiasts from all over the state that connects with trails. It's a very exciting place. Um, and that's on, on June 3rd uh, from two to five. And then the following week is the annual open road along the ocean loop. And that is no cars, only people rolling and strolling for almost the full length of Ocean Avenue, as well as Hazard Road. Um, no cars, worry-free, car-free, access to one of the most iconic um, routes uh, on Aquinnick Island, maybe in New England. Um, and that uh, is from 9 to 12 on June 10th. And we would love to see people there. All really spectacular stuff. Multimodal. It's the way to think about the future. It's the way to well, think about the present. Modal. Let's do it. Let's let's knock it That's off with this nonsense. I'm tired of hearing, you know, um, like you said, it framed transit frame purely in an economic context there's some conversations that are happening now about uh rydot taking over ripta it'll be interesting to see how that plays out whether i'm not sure if scott avadesian has the experience necessary to to manage ripta a uh, nice enough guy uh but uh, there's a lot of questions that swirl in political circles and it'll be interesting to see where that plays out if a new whether it's it's dot or Ideally, somebody with fresh perspective can kind of be that link in that multimodal uh, transit aspect of things. I'm not asking you to comment on anybody. That's, I'm going to make a quick comment. That's yeah, just that please. I think that we should fund transit before we judge it. And then, mm. we'll, and then we can have that conversation. 
very well said. And I think that's a, that's something that needs to be accounted for in all of those conversations. It's let's look at the the the, the dollars before the the personnel because the personnel can't do much without the the right dollars. So well said. Actually, one bonus question here. So there's interesting dialogue that's taking place on Smith Hill around e-bike, e-bike legislation. Um, your thoughts on that? I don't have the bill in front of me. Some Oftentimes I'll have it in front of me to sort of read it and, and at least give um, you know a summary of, of what's happening. But if you could sort of frame your position on e-bikes and the legislation that's being heard right now. Sure. Thanks for asking, because there really needs to be more more discussion. We're concerned about you know, like a frenzy of um, of concern about e-bikes um, that doesn't seem to be, uh, you know, well informed by both the use of bikes, the categories of these bikes, and you know where this legislation is coming from. The regulation is coming from what's being proposed in Rhode Island is the same regulation and legislation that's been passed in forty states. So we haven't made this up. And what it does is it defines the bikes by the uh, by the technology and the power, so that um, you know we're t- the bikes that so many people are are embracing and uh, able to get back on or stay on bikes because of the pedal assist that helps people to um, not be deterred by uh, by a distance or by a hill, for example. Uh, they're extremely popular with people who are aging. They're extremely popular with people who are shifting out of their cars to get to work. Um, you know, we we need to talk with people about how to use them. We need to regulate um, the speed that they're used at, but they are a very, very important part of that multimodal transportation um, mode distribution that we were talking about earlier as well. So I encourage everyone to um, to uh, listen and think about um, why, uh, why uh, electric assist bikes are so important, you know, as... Uh, as, as modes in this discussion and to recognize that uh, in Rhode Island, we're talking about adopting uh, policies and practices that have been adopted in 40 other states. You know, we, we need to all get uh, together to be able to reduce traffic uh, congestion and introduce more people onto uh, healthy, physically healthy and mentally healthy um, options for short distances. Yeah, it's it's really important to educate folks about it. I did see that some legislators were riding around the parking lot of the state house on e-bikes, yes. but they really are an important tool for, like you said, for for even for folks that are um, of of what I, I don't know of an age that you you would not expect to need an e-bike, I guess, based on that standard or you know, otherwise don't have any disability or anything like that, there's still a good entry point for a lot of people to get on bikes, especially in Newport, you know, riding up the hill by Hotel Viking one time can discourage somebody from (laughs) saying, hey, I don't want to, I don't want to do this anymore. E-bikes can help in those moments and transition someone to a multimodal type of, of, of format. We have a fantastic new uh, town counselor in Middletown, Emily Tessier, uh, who, uh, she ran based on bicycle and pedestrian issues, but she sold her car and bought a pedal assist bike. And that's how she gets around, you know, 12 months out of the year. Um, and she's, you know, I, I, I don't know if she's 30 yet, you know, she's um, and that's that's her mode of transportation. And I grab an e-bike if I have to get to a meeting quickly and, you know, and I just I don't want to pedal up the hill. And, you know, I just want to be able to get there looking a little fresher. Um, not that you don't look fresh when you ride a bike, <laughs> you can still look fresh riding a bike. Uh, but yeah, all of these things, all these things contribute. We really need to think about all of the different modes, how to manage them, you know, how to make them accessible, how to encourage them, how to give people the chance to get out of their cars, you know, and enjoy some fresh air and, and be able to stop and go, you know, where they want to. People who ride bikes are contributing significantly to our economy in different ways. The economic benefits of biking are, you know, really, really uh, consistent and well-documented um, and uh, are very much um, a part of the success of touristic destinations like Rhode Island. So yeah, let's, let's, let's think uh, positively and creatively and, and like 21st century people. At HealthSource RI for Employers, we provide access to health insurance to more than 1,100 local businesses and nonprofits. 
and 96% of them renew through us every year. Maybe it's our choice of 19 different health plans, our 10 years of customizing solutions, or our one local team of dedicated experts helping employers find quality health insurance. See how our numbers stack up for you. Learn more at healthsourceri.com slash employers.